Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm aware that people are still joining, but we have a very full agenda for today's webinar. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Kendra Strauss. I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University and the director of the Labor Studies Program. And I'm just going to be introducing our webinar to kick us off today. So you're joining Beyond the Pandemic, Permanent Paid Sick Leave for BC Workers. And we're thrilled to have a really exciting panel to speak to this very pressing issue in BC today. I just want to start by respectfully acknowledging that the three campuses of Simon Fraser University re reside on the unceded and stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Coquitlam, Kwaikwet, Kwantlen, Semyamu, and Suwasan peoples. And I'm joining today from the traditional and unceded territories of, of the Lekungun speaking people. So our event today is part of a webinar series hosted by the Labor Studies Program at Simon Fraser University called A Just Recovery. It's co-organized and led by the BC Federation of Labor, and we've had the generous support of the Van City Credit Union for this event. For more information or to register for our events mailing list, please visit our website at sfu.ca slash labor. And today's topic, as I mentioned, is beyond the pandemic, permanent paid sick leave for BC workers. So to kick us off, I'd like to start by introducing our moderator. We're lucky to have Mo Amir with us today, the host and producer of This Is Van Color, Vancouver's most popular politics and culture podcast which has hosted a wide variety of colorful guests, including BC Premier John Horgan, BC NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, former BC Premier Christy Clark, Mayor Kennedy Stewart, and a wide array of other politicians, media personalities, academics, and entertainers. Formerly a commentator at CKNW Global News, Mo is a radio columnist for CBC Radio's On the Coast with Gloria Makarenko, an opinionist for Vancouver is awesome and a federal elections analyst for Czech News. We're very proud that he's also a graduate of Simon Fraser University, receiving both his Bachelor of Business Administration and his Master's in Political Science here at SFU. So without further ado, I'm pleased to turn it over to Mo to take us forward. Thanks, Mo. Thank you, Kendra. I am very excited to be here. I acknowledge that I am joining you today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coquitlam First Nations. I thank the Coquitlam who continue to live on these lands and care for them, along with the waters and all that is above and all that is below. So, as a media person, commentator, uh, I've been a big proponent for paid sick leave on the radio, on my podcast, but I'm also part of a family business and there's nine of us in the office and I actually wear many hats, you know, being a family business and all. And one of them ends up being strategic human resources. And to be honest, we never really thought about paid sick leave until the pandemic. And aside from mandated health and safety measures, including uh, telecommuting, we made a moral and a, and a safety choice to advise everyone in our office that if they were to fall sick, flu symptoms, a cold, whatever, don't come into the office. But we also told everyone, don't worry about your pay. Taking a few days to get better, to get tested for COVID, to recover from COVID in the worst case scenario, uh, is totally fine and you will not be penalized for, for it. That's what we did in, in our office. Health and safety obviously is, is the priority. And it's not just because we didn't want the office to shut down. It's, it's because we didn't want to feel any, we didn't want anyone to feel duress while they're already not, not feeling well. And the reality is, is that it took a pandemic for us to reach this conclusion. Of course, we would never want anyone to come into the office if they were sick pre-pandemic, but the importance of being able to take care of yourself 
while not spreading the illness, all while not worrying about being docked uh, on your paycheck really came into focus because of COVID where, again, we explicitly told our team that your paycheck will not be affected if you fall sick. But health should always explicitly be the priority of any workplace. And so the, the conversation today is important because also today the Ministry of Labor in BC has issued the results of a survey outlining three options for paid sick leave, three days, five days, and 10 days, as the province contemplates bringing in the first permanent paid sick leave program for BC. We have some great speakers who are going to join us today to discuss what is at stake for workers, how paid sick leave programs can work, and how they impact existing inequities in our communities. Before we dive in, I just wanna really quickly cover some of the logistics of the event. <clears throat> so we are gathering in the spirit of mutual support and respect for each other. We acknowledge the diverse learning journeys that we're all on. We are all listening to learn. We accept and expect non-closure. We are leaving our assumptions at the door in order to facilitate a non-judgmental space for dialogue. We don't assume pronouns, gender, or other identifiers based on someone's username or video image. There will be zero tolerance for those promoting violence on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious affiliation, or ability. Anyone inciting harm towards other participants in this webinar via chat, interactive, or other webinar functions will be removed at the discretion of our technical team and moderator. This event is in webinar format, and that means that you will only be able to see the panelists. Audience members will not be visible to each other. This event is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be sent to all the attendees from SFU following the event. It will also be posted uh, so those who couldn't join us today can view it later. Live captioning is available and it's actually really good. Uh, and you can access it by, by clicking on the live transcript button at the top of your Zoom screen. Chat between participants is disabled. We will be taking questions from the audience, however. And if you wanna ask a question, please submit it to, to me by using the Q&A function on your screen. I will be collecting all the questions and putting them to, uh, to the panelists during the Q&A section, which is partway through our uh, webinar today. We will also be live tweeting the event. So if you wanna follow along or contribute, use the hashtag, hashtag BC paid sick days. And also, you know, follow me on Twitter at Van Color. <laughs> I gotta do a little self-promotion. Now, I'd like to, it, it's really my honor to introduce the uh, Minister Harry Baines. I'm very pleased to, that we can get things rolling with, Minister, with the BC Minister of Labor, Harry Baines. Mr. Bain, uh, Minister Baines is the MLA representing Surrey Newton, and he was first elected in 2005. As the Minister of Labor, he has taken a number of important steps to improve the lives of working people, including raising the minimum wage to $15.20 an hour. As mentioned earlier, the Ministry of Labor is currently engaged in a consultation to determine the number of paid sick days that will be brought in permanently. So at this moment, I'd like to turn things over to Minister Baines to bring his greetings. Thank you, Mo. <clears throat> it's really, really uh, good to see you uh, on the screen. Uh, I hear you uh, all the time, but uh, for the first time, I'm engaging with you. So thank you very much. And, uh, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, and I want to thank you uh, for inviting me to speak to you for a few minutes. And uh, to begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, that I am speaking from unceded territory of Coast Village people, including Kwanlin, Katsis, and Samyamu. And I join Dr. Strauss in welcoming everyone, particularly uh, uh, you know, those who are uh, participating from across the country and actually across the world. And in particular, I would like to welcome my counterpart, uh, Minister Michael Wood from New Zealand. Uh, Minister, good to see you. Uh, we hear all the good things that your government uh, is doing and have been doing and are really uh, happy to, to have you here and that you are 
setting uh, the, the the bar for for all the countries to 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 uh, match, and I think uh, you should be proud of that. And um, also, I'm really pleased to be part of this webinar because our government joined you in the belief that no worker should have to choose to go to work sick or stay home, lose pay. And one of the most critical lessons of COVID-19 is the importance of people staying home when they're sick to contain the spread of uh, illness and keep workplaces safe and productive. Our government has responded to the pandemic with support to the workers and businesses. Our first step was to introduce presumption and job protective leave for those who become ill uh, due to COVID-19. So workers could access benefits and would not lose their job when they're ready to go back to work. We put in uh, uh, at least three hours of paid leave so workers can go and have a both doses uh, of their vaccinations. And in addition to that, unpaid leave so workers can support their dependents to get vaccinated. Most recently, we have uh, ensured that the employees get up to three days of paid sick leave for illnesses that are related to COVID-19, which program will end December 31st of this year. These measures uh, build on our previous work to establish paid domestic and sexual violence leave. Of course, many workplaces already provide paid sick leave to their employees, but we also know that about half of all work workers and workplaces do not have access to this benefit. So most of these workers are in lower paying jobs, often held by women and racialized workers those who can least afford to lose wages because those are the workers who are paycheck to paycheck, can't afford to stay home, lose pay. And so they end up going to work. That's one of the things that we learned in the first phase of, of, uh, of our consultation, that the both employer and workers were concerned that the workers, when they were sick, they go to work because they couldn't afford to stay home. So for the first time, ever in British Columbia, we are creating a permanent province by paid sick leave for employees who cannot work due to any personal illness or injury starting January 1st, 2022. Since we introduced legislation for this in May, we have been engaging with the public, stakeholders, workers, and employers. Many of you are uh, on the screen right now who have been participating and pushing for this. Uh, during the first month of consultation, over 26,000 workers and businesses completed survey to help us understand their current arrangement for paid sick leave and what is needed. Where are the gaps? Now informed by those survey results and targeted discussions, we have developed options that cover the minimum entitlement. In fact, as it was mentioned, the option paper was released just this morning and once again, we're inviting all British Columbians to have their say and participate in this conversation. I encourage all of you here that are present to go on government's engagement site to view the options. They are available to comment until October 25th. For a good part of my life, I was involved as many of you were in labor movement. And I know the importance of protecting and supporting workers. But paid sick leave is not just about supporting workers. I wanna make that clear. Having paid sick leave is also good for businesses, good for our communities, and it will help our economy to come faster and as we navigate these unprecedented times. The panelists can provide more insight into the benefits of paid sick leave program around the globe. And I appreciate them joining us here today to offer their expertise and thank to the BC Foundation of Labor, Simon Fraser University for arranging these important conversations. And I wanna thank you, Mo. Good to see you and enjoy the rest of the session. It is going to be really good. I assure you of that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Minister Baines. Very, very much appreciated. Before we launch into our panel today, uh, we wanna center our conversation around workers to get a sense of why paid sick leave is something that workers are calling for and what their experience has been like on the front lines. So here are some short video messages from workers to share with you.
think we're just put, <laughs> putting up the video. Give it one sec. My name is Amelia, working at Guilford Town Center, housekeeping department. My name is Agnes Estimo, and I'm a porter at Metropolis at Metro Town. I have an under, underlying condition. I have a two years cancer survivor. So if I have not feeling well because of my underlying condition, I have only three days paid sick leave. Having no paid sick days, uh, we feel so frustrated are we going to be healthy are we going to be sickly or whatsoever so 10 days is very very suitable for us our workers every worker should have that paid sick days regardless of the status of the job my name is andres and i work as a housekeeper for 15 years i am elizabeth cabrera and I'm working at Metro Police Metro Town. Having paid sick days really helps me, not only me, but also my family. I am devastated because uh, no one supports me except myself. So if I have, uh, if I don't like, I don't go to work, then how can I earn uh, money or income? My name is Roxanne Montgomery. I am a janitor and I've worked since 2003. Well, if I'm not well after three days, I just hope I don't infect anybody and go to work. That's a tough thing to have to do. Yes. Your choice is just to go to work and your body is not really ready for the work. It's really very stressful. They should pay us for the paid sick days because we work for them and they make the business out of our effort, oh yeah. So, and we are their best asset to have their business grow and expand. So we are their best asset. So employers need to pro uh, protect their asset, just like me and you. So I'm fighting for it. Government must listen to us. For this request, for this, whatever what you call this petition or whatsoever, we need this 10 day paid sick leave. I hope the government will listen to the workers itself. And so at this point, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. First, the Honorable Michael Wood is the Minister of Transport and Minister of Workplace Relations and Safety in New Zealand. Michael was first elected to the New Zealand Parliament in 2016. Prior to that position, he held a number of roles, including Chief Labour Whip. Following the 2020 general election, Michael became a sworn, a sworn member of the executive and was appointed by the right Honorable Jacinda Arden as the Minister of Transport and Minister Responsible of Workplace Relations and Safety. He is also given, he was also given the role of Deputy Leader of the House. Michael is an advocate for strong, fair, and supportive communities. He believes that an economy and public institutions that are both uh, focused on people's well-being will lead to a society that is more prosperous and just. New Zealand has just increased their paid sick leave requirements from five days to 10 days. And Minister Wood, thank you so much for being here. I know it's early in the morning where you are. I'd love to hear more about uh, what you guys have been doing in New Zealand. The virtual floor is yours. Kia ora koutou katoa and uh, good morning. It's my real pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. Can I first start by acknowledging my counterpart, the Honourable uh, Harry Baines, and it was very good to hear from you uh, before and about the progress that you're making uh, for working people in BC. Uh, can I also acknowledge the uh, Labour leaders uh, who are on this call as well for your ongoing work uh, in this area too. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, dialogue and while we will always take the view that it's up to 
um, other jurisdictions to work their own way through their issues and come to the best solutions. I'm very happy to talk a bit about New Zealand's experience and why this has been uh, an important move for us. Uh, we had a general election uh, last year, and I know that we've been eagerly watching the uh, Canadian federal election this week, and uh, our Labour Party took into that election um, a wide-ranging manifesto focused on improving uh, working people's lives and rights. And one of the very clear commitments we did make at that time was to increase our statutory minimum sick leave from the previous level of five days per annum to 10 days uh, per annum. And we made it a, a priority. So our uh, new cabinet was sworn in in November of last year. And the first piece of legislation that we tabled was the legislation uh, to increase sick leave to 10 days. Uh, that worked through the parliamentary pro uh, process and took effect as of uh, July of this year. So it was something that we put some real priority on. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, the first one is obviously the way in which the COVID pandemic has reminded us just how important it is for people who are sick to stay at home. A and for me, it's been a really good example of an issue where there's a fusion of rights perspectives. There's the important individual right that if you're unwell and you need to recover for your own health and your own well-being, that you should have a reasonable facility to be able to stay at home and do that. But there are also collective rights at stake here as well, because we do know, and COVID has reminded us, um, that if you are sick and you come into work, there is a very high risk that you pass your illness onto others. You affect the well-being of other people. Yet we know if there is inadequate sick leave in place, that many workers have little choice but to do that. And we heard an example on the, the video uh, just before. I think the new perspective that COVID has then added in is that beyond the rights of the individual and the rights of people in the workplace, um, there is a risk for the whole society in a pandemic environment that if we're not able to contain illness, um, then the risk of it spreading and creating massive disruption is also very serious indeed. So we have, like you, provided some targeted forms of additional leave to support people uh, who might have to take time away for uh, testing or is managed isolation and that kind of thing. But in general, we think this presses the case for more adequate sick leave. Um, the history of sick leave provision in New Zealand is a relatively interesting one. So prior to our shift to 10 days of sick leave, there was five days per annum available as a statutory minimum. That came into effect in 1991. Um, at that time in our political history, we had a, a right-wing government in power that um, undertook a program of massive labour market deregulation in an attempt to um, really crush collective bargaining and the strength of unions. Um, they passed a piece of legislation called the Employment Contracts Act that um, abolished what we call our, called our national awards, which are our big sector-level employment agreements and replace them either with individual agreements or enterprise-based collective bargaining. Um, now, pr prior to that, the industry awards often had reasonable entitlements to things like sick leave and other employment rights. And one of the concessions that that government at that time made was that as it was dismantling those, it would put in place a base statutory minimum of five days sick leave per year. So that, that was the genesis of that. Um, the entitlement that we has, um, have ha has a carryover arrangement, so a worker can carry over up to a maximum um, of 15 days sick leave uh, per annum using any sick leave that they have not utilised in the previous year up to that uh, cap. We do know from our research that prior to bringing in the uh, 10 days minima in our recent reform process, that around about 50% of workers who were covered by collective agreements already had 10 days or more with a small number having what's called in our jurisdiction flexible sick leave, which is a form of sick leave without any specific limit, limit which, is, but which is managed by the employer uh, and the employee. So look, those are the, the general, the, the gist of uh, what we've uh, done there. We are also looking to uh, potentially make some improvements in the future. At the moment, a worker has to be in their job for six months before they qualify. And we're looking at an entitlement for day one that we might bring in next year. The response has generally been good for people. from people. There has been some resistance. We've had to work it through with the small business community in particular. But in general, there's a high level of uh, acceptance uh, to this change. 
Uh, and, and as I said before, I think people understand in the current environment and have been reminded just how important good paid sick leave is. And I, I wish you well as you carefully work through this issue and, and come to an outcome that's good for your workers in BC. Thank you so much, Minister Wood. And of course, if you have any questions for the Honourable Minister Wood, you can uh, type those in in the question and answer uh, box there, and we'll, we'll get to those in just a little bit. Our next panelist is Dr. Stephanie Premji. She is an associate professor at the School of Labor Studies at McMaster University. Dr. Premji is interested in the working conditions, health problems, and access to care and compensation of low-income immigrant and racialized workers. Her current research focuses on experience experiences of precarious work, health, and return to work among the Toronto Bangladeshi community in partnership with the South Asian Women's Rights Organization. Dr. Premji is also the author of the edited collection, Sick and Tired Health and Safety Inequalities. Dr. Premji, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mo, um, and thank you for inviting me to this important discussion in support of paid sick leave. Uh, as Mo mentioned, I researched the work and health of low-income immigrant and racialized workers. I've been doing so for the past uh, two plus decades. For the past year and a half, I've been essentially since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been uh, working on a study with the South Asian Women's Rights Organization, which is a small community organization in Toronto that works primarily with Bangladeshi women. And uh, the objective of our study is to document experiences of precarious work in the Bangladeshi community, and also to examine how the pandemic has shaped those experiences. Um, so, so far, we've spoken to 45 workers as part of our little community-based study, and uh, almost all of the workers that we spoke to lacked access to paid sick leave. Uh, here in Ontario, after months of advocacy, uh, a temporary paid sick leave uh, program was put in place by the Ford government last spring uh, that provides for three paid sick days. Uh, but for most of our study, almost all of the workers we spoke with didn't have access to any form of paid sick leave. And this really reflects uh, a larger reality whereby the large majority of low income and precariously employed workers do not have access to paid sick leave. In fact, what the data shows is that the lower the income, uh, the lower the likelihood of having paid sick leave. Um, and it's also important to mention, as, a, as has been mentioned before, that these jobs are disproportionately held by women, migrant, immigrants, uh, Black, Indigenous, uh, uh, and racialized workers. So um, while low-income workers are more uh, likely to lack paid sick leaves, they're also the ones who need it the most. Uh, because as we saw in our study, uh, the workers cannot afford to take time off when they live to, uh, pay to, paycheck to paycheck, uh, when they're paid by the hour and sometimes even paid by the piece, uh, and when they may not be able to cover rent or food uh, if they don't go to work. With the pandemic, this need has only been amplified because uh, these are also the workers who are disproportionately working on the front lines and therefore more likely to be exposed to the virus, just like the childcare workers, the food industry workers, and the factory workers in our study. And this need for paid sick leave has also been amplified because low income workers have shouldered the biggest economic impact of the pandemic. So in the absence of paid sick leave, the workers that we spoke with described being afraid of losing income or even their, their job if they called in sick. And it wasn't an unfounded fear uh, given the precarity of their employment. And in fact, many of the workers that we spoke with told us that their employer had told them explicitly that they would lose their job if they called in sick. Uh, we also heard uh, about some temporary employment agencies uh, penalizing workers who call in sick by deducting amounts from their pay. 
So the impact of all this uh, is that workers are incentivized to go to work when sick, which is obviously not good for the workers' physical and mental health. Um, and, and what we see in our, in, in our study is that these health problems often deteriorate as a result. Importantly, there's also an impact on uh, families and communities. So in our study, we documented significant intergenerational impacts of precarious work, uh, which includes lack of paid sick leave. And in fact, we're seeing another pandemic in the community, which is a mental health pandemic um, that workers and advocates uh, feel is closely linked to uh, the uh, rise in precarious employment. Given the pandemic, obviously, incentivizing workers to go to work when sick is not good for public health. Uh, we know that workplaces with precarious jobs that lack paid sick leave have seen thousands of cases of workplace transmission of COVID-19 in Canada. We think, for example, of long-term care homes, uh, processing plants, farms, warehouses, fulfillment centers. Um, so there are a number of things that we can do to make sure that uh, paid sick leave is accessible to those who need it the most. Um, but um, I am happy to talk about this a little bit later on. Uh, and I'll end us, uh, on this note and I welcome any questions and comments later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Premji. And again, if you have any questions and answers, uh, and I'm talking to the participants, or sorry, the, uh, the attendees here, if you have any questions or answers, please just write them in the question and answer box and we can discuss them uh, very shortly. Our next panelist is Kim Novak, the president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 1518. Kim Novak is a dedicated union leader who has spent her entire career fighting for fairness for workers. She has a long history with UFCW 1518, first as a clerk and a member at Safeway, then working in communications as a union representative, director, and secretary treasurer before unanimously being elected as president by the executive board in 2019. She became vice president of UFCW International in 2020. She has put human rights, anti-racism, and social justice at the heart of her work at UFCW uh, 15. Uh, Kim has been an outspoken advocate for paid sick leave for all her members and all workers in BC. Kim, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for the introduction, Mo. And uh, I will say I'm I'm blown away by the expertise that we have from the other two panelists. So thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. I will start by saying that I am zooming in from the traditional and unceded territory of the Kite First Nation, which is, is in what is now called New Westminster. A lot of the things that I would say about reasons why paid sick leave are important were already covered by um, Minister Wood and by Dr. Premji. So I think maybe what I'll do is I'll bring the perspective of what we've heard over the last 18 months from workers in this pandemic. And I think those videos are a real testimony to the realities that workers are facing. And unfortunately, those are the voices that are marginalized and often silenced in this debate because we go to the leaders what will the leader say about this versus the people who were actually the most impacted? And so it started for us, the real tell in COVID was when one of the poultry plants that is not unionized in Vancouver, United Poultry, had 28 cases of COVID and got shut down. And then suddenly the conversation changed. It wasn't the union who was saying, we need more, we need more. It was business saying, we can't produce, we can't make money. And I think that's the real tell in this pandemic is what, what have we always considered benefit versus right versus actually making businesses be able to operate and sustain challenges like a pandemic or sickness in general and as a society we have done a disservice to paid sick time we have rewarded people for coming to work sick you get a bonus for never missing a day at work because you were committed and you came to work so already we've got this first layer of if you really care about your job and you really care about this workplace you won't let us down by calling in sick so that's already out there. And that's something that we've grown up in, in various jobs. I mean, I started in retail. That was certainly a reward was do not call in sick or we'll question you and we'll think that you're lying to us because you couldn't possibly be sick. There must be this other reason. And I think that's a really 
uh, an argument that business often falls to is, well, if we give everyone 10 paid sick days, they'll use them all. And therefore we won't be able to run our business. They won't actually be sick. But the reality is when we look at our collective agreements that have paid sick days, that's not what's happening. People are calling in sick when they're sick and they're not using them if they don't need to. So that in itself is just one of those fallacies that's out there that I think we just need to address head on. And for that maybe 1% that's using it, address that. But let's not punish the 99% who should have access to this, not as a benefit, but as a right. And in order to keep businesses running and to keep workers working, there needs to be a rights-based approach to paid sick leave. It shouldn't be the more money you make, the higher level position you have, the less you're on working on a front line and instead working in your home, then you get the paid sick time. And what's really interesting, I find, is that we're not seeing, and I know small business is also where we look at it. It's like, how are we going to hurt small business if this is a benefit that gets brought into effect? But it's actually the large, huge corporate conglomerates that actually have the money to be able to pay these benefits that have been able to utilize these frontline workers as their largest asset, particularly through a pandemic, that are saying, oh, no, 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 we couldn't possibly add that. And that, again, goes back to, no, one of the investments in running a business is investing in your people, it's investing in community, and it's investing in making your workplaces safe because this at the end of the day is a health and safety issue. And to call it anything short of that is actually not putting it in the place that it needs to be. It's not a benefit, it is a health and safety issue to keep those workers who have to make a choice right now between coming to work sick and staying home and not being paid and everyone else they're interacting with in that workplace and the schools that their children go to and the care homes that their loved ones go to. So I think my real passion in this is really identifying those worker stories and how that impacts all levels, whether it be business, whether it be from the union's perspective, whether it be from the community-based perspective and seeing the fact that New Zealand has been able to do it and it's and look at what's happening with COVID and how they're being able to actually battle that. I mean, I, I'm so excited to hear more from you today, Minister Wood, on how that is working as, as a part of the larger system and prioritizing people. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much, Kim. And I can definitely feel the, the passion you have for this topic. So thank you for that. Um, we are running a little behind, but I, I want to throw a question out there to all of you. Uh, Minister Wood, if, if you would uh, be kind enough to, to answer this question first, uh, maybe limit it to about a minute or so. What do you think are the most important factors that policymakers right here in BC need to get right when designing a paid sick leave program. And, and Minister Wood, I guess you could probably speak from experience. Well, thanks. Um, a range of factors to consider in the policy design, obviously, and to some degree it will need to um, be framed by the particular nature of your institutions and practices and history uh, in, in BC. But a couple of things come to mind. Um, the first would be that this does need to be, in my view anyway, um, a universal right. Um, one of the core things about having a statutory minimum, and this has come up in uh, the discussion a, a, on a number of occasions, is that we currently have inequalities. Um, we currently do have uh, workers within our system, certainly in New Zealand, and it, it sounds the same in BC, um, who do have reasonable access to paid sick leave provision. Um, but who are the workers who don't tend to have it? Well, certainly in our jurisdiction, it tended to be our Māori, our Indigenous people, our Pacific people, low-paid women, migrant workers. And so one of the key aspects of a statutory minimum scheme is that we ensure that there is a level of equality uh, that applies across the system. So I think ensuring that there is wide application, universal application, uh, is incredibly important. Um, I think it is important to think about um, whether there is some value in having a carryover aspect to it. I'm not sure whether your discussions have got to that point as well. Um, and one of the other key design um, aspects is what it applies to. Uh, in our system, um, a person's sick leave can also apply in situations where that person has to take care of dependents. Uh, and that provides um, particular value to many of our workers, particularly um, families who might have a number of children. And that was one of the other compelling reasons to uh, have uh, a 10 day provision over and above a five day provision. You can imagine if you have a few kids, they get sick as kids do every year, um, that five days can run out pretty quickly. So I think those are a couple of key things uh, to think through. Final one I'll just chuck in there is your qualifying period. As I say, we currently have a qualifying period. You have to have been in your role for six months 
before you uh, qualify for the entitlement. And we are looking at addressing that and probably having the entitlement bleed in over the first six months of a worker's employment. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Premji, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yes, I mean, there are a number of characteristics that, uh, that need to be part of a functioning paid sick leave system that really works for everyone. Uh, I agree that having a universal system is important so that part-time, full-time workers are covered, uh, that workers are covered uh, irrespective of immigration or migration status, of whether they're permanent or temporary. Uh, also important is um, to make sure that workers, uh, such as informal workers, self-employed, gig workers, um, are also, don't end up falling through the cracks, but that we also cover these workers. And obviously we need to work out, I mean, who would pay for the sick leave and what, you know, wage would be calculated, but it's important because those workers are typically excluded from, um, from uh, regulations. Um, another important aspect would be uh, for sick leave to be hassle-free. Um, it, it should be accessible without a medical note. I mean, we've had the you know, physicians saying that they, they don't want to be part of that. They don't want to have to provide medical notes, especially when there's already such demand on the healthcare system. Um, and if so, it should also be um, available, accessible on uh, someone's regular paycheck. Um, because the workers just can't wait. They can't wait. They can't uh, you know, file a claim and, and have a delay to get paid. Uh, not possible for the workers who live page, paycheck to paycheck. And also filing a claim, the process of filing a claim can be extremely difficult, especially for workers who experience language barriers. And we've seen that in our research with regards to workers' compensation, that uh, they will not file a claim as a result of, of language barriers. Um, I think importantly, it should cover the full salary because uh, you know wages are already low, and I think it 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 it's not possible to add, with such low wages to penalize people for for taking time off. Another aspect, especially given the results of our study, is that there should be some kind of guaranteed job protection um, for those who take paid sick leave. Uh, we know that employers regularly violate different provisions of employment standards, whether it's uh, overtime or rest periods. And we also know that workers don't complain. So we need um, a clear and easy complaint uh, process, but we also need uh, oversight and enforcement to make sure that there's compliance in the first place. And just one last thing that I wanna mention is I think that we need outreach. We need outreach to let people know uh, about their entitlements. Uh, in our studies, for instance, people confused uh, work-related injuries and illnesses with non-work-related injuries and illnesses and kind of grouped them in this one big cate category. Uh, a lot of workers are not even aware of the workers' compensation system. So I think we need outreach to let people know that, first of all, uh, these rights exist. And second of all, to legitimize the, the use of paid sick leave so that workers feel that they can and are not reluctant to uh, go to their employer. Thank you so much. And, and Kim, what sort of factors are you looking at as BC looks to design this paid sick leave program? Yeah, I agree with everything that's already been said. And I, I think one of the ways to really integrate it into our legislation is something that raises the, the floor for everyone, is it really being a health and safety issue. And when we look at it that way, when we look at this as a right that all workers should have, it really takes away from the discretion of, well, this person has to pay a benefit here or what type of work are you doing? And that goes to the equality issue and the equity issues that I think have been previously raised. Because at the end of the day, if we don't look at this as health and safety, we look at it as some benefit that's going to be abused, like I was saying before. And so when we when we change the, the dialogue to how is this going to help workers be able to take the time they need to get healthy, whether that be from COVID related symptoms, whether that be because they hurt themselves um, on their own time, or whether it be mental health. Because for so often, we look at workers who then have to go on to, to long-term paid leave or unpaid leave, I should say, when really if they had gotten the treatment that they needed and then been given access to the time that they needed, 
then you wouldn't have that. And let's be honest, we are seeing intense work workage shortages right now across the board. And so when we don't value and care for workers the way they need to be cared for, they're leaving industries and they're going elsewhere. And that leads to the precarity of work. They're jumping around if they don't feel like they've been supported by their employer. And this was an opportunity through the pandemic to look at ways to write legislation that helps build community, that helps make our province stronger than it was prior to the pandemic. And if we don't take lessons, like looking at how we're valuing the rights of sick, paid sick leave and not leaving those who are already most marginalized behind, we've really missed out on an opportunity to make this province stronger and for business to do better because they have employees they can rely on to come to work because they know they're going to have the time off if they need it without consequence. So I think all of those factors really need to be integrated into the legislation and focus more than anything on it being a health and safety issue for workers, both who are may be sick and the people who they're going to work to, to be exposed. And on the front lines, when you look at grocery stores, when you look at food processing plants, when you look at healthcare sector of community home support, you're literally interacting in close proximity to other people. So it is putting them at risk. And I think that needs to be highlighted in this discussion. Thank you so much for that. And again, just a reminder to anyone that's attending, you can always uh, write a question in the question and answer box. I'm already seeing one theme emerge and it's this question around how do you incorporate a uh, paid sick leave program that protects you know independent contractors whether they are gig workers on various different apps how do you how do you make sure it protects seasonal farm workers i mean i think conceptually it's easy enough to to think about salaried workers or wage workers in terms of how you protect them but when we look when we expand the uh, the definition of employment and the different types of employment um, how do we protect them through a paid sick leave program and so Let's make this a little more free for all. I don't want to have to call to, to any of you. E either three of you can, can jump in at any time and, 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 and share your thoughts, please. Well, I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about gig workers and how if they're identified as employees, we could take one of those barriers out right now <laughs> and they would be able to have access to this. But it's a really good point. And, and Dr. Premji already spoke to this. You know, when we look at gig workers, when we look at farm workers, when we look at workers who don't have already the same rights of the people who we're already fighting for to try and get paid sick leave, we see business and employers exploiting those workers even further. And so when we are able to identify this whole group of people, and I'll use the example of gig workers as non-employees, then you just shift the work onto those people more. So that way you get avoid having to pay for the health and safety benefits. And let's also recognize that these gig workers are also frontline workers. They're the people driving you if they're working for Uber. They're the people delivering your food, going into restaurants if they work for one of the food delivery apps. They are grocery pickers if they work for Instacart. So they're working in grocery stores and then delivering that food to people. And so if we continue to have these, um, these gig workers not recognized as employees and not covered by the legislation to ensure that they have the time off that they need, they're not only putting themselves and their families at risk, but every single person that they interact with. And if we're going to continue to, we, we can't stop gig work from coming. That's clear. It's like trying to tell someone, don't go on the internet and go to the library to do your research. Like we recognize it's coming. So we need to be proactive in how we put some parameters around protecting workers in that world, because people are moving into those industries and they deserve rights when they're over there. So I think that has to be a huge topic of discussion on whatever the paid sick leave program in BC looks like. It must include precarious workers in whether they be temporary foreign workers, whether they be part-time, casual, or gig workers. Because if we don't do that, we've lost an opportunity to really lift the bar for everyone. I think those are very well-made points. We, we can't be king canute about this, but we do need to make sure that rights are appropriately applied to people who are carrying out real work in our economies and our societies. We haven't entirely cracked this issue in our system. Uh, so the application of sick leave in our system applies to employees, that is employees of any stripe, um, permanent, uh, part-time, casual, seasonal workers, um, but doesn't, doesn't apply to people who might be in a contracting uh, employment arrangement. Um, but we have got a, work of, a stream of work um, up and going, which we are working through on a tripartite basis with our Council of Trade Unions and Peak Business Body. And it's basically looking at this issue from two frames. Um, the first is to say, do we need a much clearer definition of the boundary between employment and contracting arrangements? Because certainly in our, in our jurisdiction, there is a massive blurring. 
And, and my view certainly is that we do have a large number of people whose real nature of employment is that of an employee who are being misclassified as contractors, and we need to address that issue. The second uh, stream is having done that, should there still be a greater suite of rights that do apply to people who are in contracting arrangements within the gig economy? And I think the answer to that is probably yes. And in our case, we are working through that. And obviously, if we did go down that track, um, sick leave would be one of those areas that we would consider. Um, yes, I mean, I agree with what has been said uh, so far on this. Um, it's also important to remember who is working in these jobs, who is working in the gig economy, who is working in part-time employment. For example, if we look at part-time work, women are disproportionately found in part-time employment. So if we, you know, if we're concerned about gender equality, for instance, uh, we want to make sure that uh, a functioning uh, paid sick leave program cover part-time employment. Um, otherwise, it results in the systemic exclusion of certain categories of workers um, from access to, to paid sick leave. Um, so, um, you know, in terms of how to do that, it does, as I mentioned, pose some challenges in terms of, you know, how do you work out... Um, you know, who would pay for the sick leave in the, in the case of uh, somebody who's self-employed, for example? Uh, how would you calculate the wage? But at the same time, I, I, I have to agree with Kim that we have to address the misclassification of gig workers as self-employed. I think that's, that's another big component. One, I, I want to go back to something uh, you just touched on, Dr. Premji, about, about gender equity. Uh, the BC government here has committed to using a gender-based plus analysis of its policies. So again, to all three of you, feel free to jump in. What should they consider to ensure that paid sick leave policy meets the needs of women, racialized workers, workers uh, with disabilities, and other groups? Um, perhaps we could say something about that. So we know that women continue to do the bulk of childcare and family work. And uh, we've seen that in the context of the pandemic. We've seen uh, that women have been disproportionately impacted by the school, the school closures and the daycare closures. Um, at the same time, because of the systemic undervaluing of women's jobs, like care workers, cashiers, the cleaners, uh, you know, servers, women, especially racialized women, are a lot more likely than men to be in lower paid occupations. And uh, both during the pandemic and also after the pandemic, access to paid sick days can actually reduce the economic burden on women who are the ones who usually take the time off to take care of sick children. Um, the other thing to think to keep in mind is that um, this is where the devil is really in the details here when it comes to what kind of paid sick leave we need to provide. Um, we've seen from studies that if you have a lower rate of replacement, so if you're not covering the full, uh, you know, the full wage, uh, that people are less likely to take paid sick leave uh, to take sick leave. And we also know that men are less likely to take leave when the replacement rate is lower. So if we have a higher replacement rate, then um, men are more likely to take it, which actually improves gender equality. What's, yeah, oh, please. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll jump in. I, I just, just sort of off, off of what Dr. Premji said with respect to women and, and the care economy and how important the care economy is in British Columbia and the fact that there is a growing demand for it. We see a shortage of child care workers. We see a shortage of home support workers. And why is this? It's because women and racialized women in particular are being driven out of these positions because they haven't been contemplated. Their needs haven't been contemplated the way that they need to be to attract people into those jobs and to keep them in those jobs. And one of the big factors in that is if you have to choose between caring for a family member and being paid and not being paid for it, then you start to do a whole overview of should I even be working? Is it worth it for me to be working in this economy or should I be not? And 
one of the things I think is also interesting is we have we predominantly represent women in our organization. So we have about 60, 65 percent women membership out of the 26,000 we represent across the province. We did not see a massive rush out of working in the industries that they work in at the beginning of COVID. They weren't rushing to apply for serve to not be working. They want to work. But if you force women to make a decision between what they need to do, they predominantly will be the ones in their homes that will stay home and not be working, not be contributing to the economy, not be bolstering business because they will be staying home while men are typically the ones who continue to go to work. And I would love to say that that is changing, but it's not. We still have such deeply seated inequalities for men and women that those needs have to be addressed in how we look at sick leave. And so, I mean, this may sound um, almost Pollyannish in a way is how do you, how do you integrate real life stories into legislation? You don't stop talking about the real life stories when you write the legislation. And if we do that, if we look at the most vulnerable workers in British Columbia and we say, how can we make life better for them here? How can we make this province stronger? And that is a factor in how you write legislation. Women won't continue to be missed in the opportunity to have and qualify for paid sick leave. And so I, that, that is what I would like to see happen. And I think it touches on what Dr. Premji was saying in the work she's done and particularly on precarious workers. Minister Wood, I, I have a question for you and, and it's come through the, uh, the chat box here. How do you implement a paid sick leave program to ensure that workers aren't actually penalized for, for taking a paid sick leave? So you know, are there safeguards that you can put in the legislation to make sure that inadvertently or very purposefully employers are not punishing someone if, if they're sick for a few days? Thanks, that's a really good point. Whenever we bring forward uh, legislation like this, we make, want to make sure that there are not perverse outcomes for the people who we're trying to uh, support. Um, I, I would have to say that in our jurisdiction, this uh, hasn't particularly proven to be a problem. Uh, so in the legislation that we have, our Holidays Act, which governs these provisions, um, it is just very clear and very black and white that these are explicit uh, legal rights that people have and that there is, there is simply no capacity within the law to be able to discriminate on the basis of uh, workers accessing these provisions in the same way that there would not be capacity to discriminate on the basis of someone taking their, their paid annual leave, their holiday leave uh, every year. Um, from time to time, of course, there can be situations where um, pressure is brought to bear uh, on a worker, uh, where unreasonable requirements in respect of provision of um, uh, medical certificates and the rest can apply. And so I do think it is important that um, that is buttressed by um, good enforcement mechanisms um, in the employment relations system, uh, whether that be through um, uh, the state, we have a, a labour inspectorate who is able to enforce these statutory rights, um, or of course through good uh, active um, union structures which are able to enforce those rights. So clarity around the fact that this is a firm legal right is important, um, but it's always the case that I think you need to also build in uh, provisions to make sure that those rights are upheld. And if uh, Dr. Premji or Kim, you'd like to jump in, please feel free. I mean, it's such a complex issue because it's, you know, at the root of this is the precarity of employment and the fears that workers have uh, when they try to exercise any of their rights. Uh, and we've seen that in the work that I've done on access to workers' compensation, that workers are either not aware that they can file a claim uh, or uh, just uh, are discouraged from doing so by employers uh, or hear of negative experiences of colleagues who, who have gone through the process. So this is where, I mean, it's, it's very tricky because there's an underlying issue, which is the employment precarity that results in this fear uh, on the part of the workers, because you know, often they don't have other opportunities on the labor market, uh, and uh, they're not in a position where they can lose income or they can lose their employment. So there needs to be some enforcement mechanism. There, there also needs to be an easy complaint mechanism for workers. Uh, but it's a very difficult question because, I mean, this is always the question that we come across of, you know, how, how do we make sure that people will actually exercise their right? 
Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult, but I think we need to, and this is going back to my point of, we need to legitimize the use of paid sick leave. We need to, to make it so that it's, it's not something that's unusual. I mean, everybody gets sick sometimes. Um, I've spoken to people who've told me, you know, in the past 10, 20 years, I've never taken one sick day. I've never stayed home. But it's not because they haven't been sick. I mean, everybody's, you know, over 10, one or two decades have been sick sometimes. So it's, it's just also going against this, you know, culture of going to work no matter what. And, you know, uh, that, that is just part of it. And to, which is really reinforced uh, by employers who tell them, you know, you come to work, you get paid, you don't come, you don't get paid. You, it's an absence. It's your problem. So, so I think we need to, to really, uh, you know, maybe through public outreach or campaigns and really also targeting workers uh, from different language groups, from different communities to really, uh, you know, bring this to the forefront that these rights are available, that, that, that it's, uh, you know, and that they, that they should exercise them. Kim, I have a, a question for you. Your members have, have obviously been on the front lines of this pandemic for, for more than a year and a half or however long it's been. It feels like a lot longer sometimes. Obviously, this takes a toll on people's mental health and, and especially people on, on the front line. How, you know, how important is it and how, I guess, realistic is it to include mental health in paid sick leave, uh, or or should it be on its own? What what are your feelings in terms of uh, mental health and this paid sick leave program and how they interact together? It's critical. I think to ignore mental health as true illness and as something that needs to be recognized and acknowledged and supported uh, is a huge miss that will have generational consequences, quite frankly. I think the same way that we have prided ourselves on not calling in sick to work when we've had a cold, if we don't make sure that there are supports in place where there are employers who say we want to push forward and support you in your mental health and then tell people that if they're in a situation in a crisis where they need a day off and they need to not be punished for it? No, the answer is no, we still need you to show up to work. That is completely <laughs> counterintuitive. And so I do think that if we're going to, again, learn something from this pandemic, it's to recognize that the effects that this has had, particularly on frontline workers, is going to last much longer than the crisis. Because whenever in a crisis, the adrenaline is running, you're just getting through it, you're focus, focus, focus. So when you look back on it after, and you realize everyone else got to stay home, except the people who were required to be at their jobs, who needed to be there so, to, so we could eat, so we could be cared for, so we could be taught. All of those important roles that these workers have been doing, then they go home and they also were dealing with the fact that there's a pandemic happening. It's, it's with them at work, it's with them in their social lives, and it's, it's going to have long-term effects. And so I think integrating that into how we are advocating for this and how we are recognizing its importance is by legitimizing it through legislation. And I think I'll take the opportunity now to touch on a little bit of what Dr. Premji was saying on that point, which is why aren't workers asking for this more? Why aren't we hearing more from workers? Why is business and employers the ones who are responding so much more than workers are? And it's because they have learned that if you're at a bargaining table, if you're in a low wage position, I need to afford to live in this city. So if I'm gonna get something from my employer, I need my wages to be better. If I'm gonna feed my family, if I'm gonna pay for childcare, I need wages. So I'll go to work sick, I can manage that. And that is exactly what we need to change. When we talk about making this a better province, we have to recognize that the reason why workers aren't screaming for this is because they're screaming for more affordable wages, more affordable housing, access to food, access to childcare. And so we can't look at this without looking at the bigger system. And so the role of the labor movement is to have this conversation and to not make it so that if you have a benefit of sick leave, if you have a benefit of recognizing that mental health is important, no, it's a right that your mental health is important. It is a right that you be safe at work. And so I think that really needs to be a part of the conversation on this is part of a bigger system at play here and workers need to be asking for this and we as their representatives need to be the ones bringing it forward. Thank you so much. And just really quickly, we're, we're a little short for time, but uh, Minister Wood, on that topic of mental health, was that something that was explicitly stated in the New Zealand program, or was it more implicit that uh, mental health was included in terms of uh, taking a sick day? 
Uh, it is implicit within our legal system and um, uh, is uh, supported uh, by judicial interpretation that our sick leave provisions apply for people who are sick. And we simply do not make the distinction uh, between someone who might be uh, sick for a physical reason or sick uh, for a mental reason. So that is very much embedded as a part of our framework and certainly something that we support. Obviously, and this has been raised, there are many more cultural barriers um, for people feeling comfortable often to come forward and identify that they need time off um, because of their mental health. And that really is the key challenge for us to, to work through now. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you for that. I, I really appreciate it. Before we get to the, the final remarks, I just wanna thank everyone for submitting their questions. Uh, there were some really great questions. Unfortunately, I could not get to them. Uh, I wanted to make sure everyone had equal time and we were kind of getting to the main themes that I was seeing in the, in the, in the question box there. Um, to, to the panelists, um, I'm just gonna go back to each one of you individually and please just uh, give us your last one minute remark, and then I will turn things over to the president of the BC Federation of Labor, Laird Cronk, to close our event. Uh, we'll go in reverse order this time. So, so Kim, um, just final remarks. Uh, let's keep workers working. Let's keep business running. Let's keep having these big discussions and how we build better communities and root it back into let strong legislation and look to New Zealand on the fact that that country is still thriving. We can do it here in BC. I have confidence this is the right move and 10 paid days is gonna make the lives of British Columbians better. And I thank you again for the opportunity. I learned a lot from both of the panelists. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Premji. Um, well, in closing, what I'd like to say is that providing paid sick leave is a workplace health issue, it's a public health issue, and it's also a social justice issue. And um, mandating paid sick days um, makes work a little bit less precarious for these workers. And this is especially important with the rise of precarious employment that we don't leave behind the gig workers, the informal workers, the self-employed, uh, and also those who work through temporary employment agencies. I also wanna say that um, paid sick leave is a short term leave. And we also need to have conversations about other types of leaves uh, like long-term family and medical leave. Uh, and it's really part of a continuum, right? A continuum of care for workers to make sure that the leaves cover every possible scenario that workers might need time off for. Uh, uh, you know, when your basement is leaking, there's no sense in patching up just part of the foundation, right? Because your basement is still gonna get flooded. So we really need to make sure that uh, the policies address uh, these cracks in the system and to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. And Minister Wood, I know it's uh, early morning there. I don't know if, you had, if you've had breakfast yet, but uh, we're almost done here. If you could leave us with your uh, final remarks, please. Well, well, thank you, Mo. And firstly, can I thank you, the organizers and my, my fellow panelists for this discussion, which I've found really valuable. And I've learned a few things in. Uh, as well. Looking at in our jurisdiction, um, we had 30 years since the early 1990s in which there was a, a low road approach to workplace relations in our country, which was based on reducing wages, reducing conditions, and the false premise that the supposed economic benefits of that would then trickle down to everyone. And the evidence is utterly overwhelming that that does not work. And in our jurisdiction, not only has that resulted in, did that result in worse pay, terms, conditions, and rights for workers, our record of economic productivity was poorer than countries um, who invested in good rights and good terms and conditions uh, for workers. And so I think it is very clear uh, through the prism of paid sick leave that the benefits of a high road approach in which we invest in workers, in which we respect their rights, in which we see, see them as whole people, not just as economic units who tune out a bit of production each day, those benefits not only accrue to that individual, but they do accru accrue more widely. Indeed, there are risks if we don't attach those rights to them. We've seen that during COVID-19, that we create risks for workplaces and the whole society if people are unable to take appropriate sick leave. We know that more broadly, workers who are invested in, um, who have good uh, training, who um, feel comfortable in their workplaces, who have a sense of well-being, will be more productive, will stick around for longer, will work harder, 
and the benefits of that accrue more widely to uh, that business and that economy as well. So I think over and above this particular issue, there is a whole vision about how we want to construe employment relations. And I'm very clear that the high road approach of respecting people, of making sure they have good rights and that they're able to get well when they're sick uh, is the way to go. So I wish you well as you work through this issue. Thank you so much for that. And, and thank you to all three of you. This was a really fascinating, interesting discussion. Uh, I've long been a proponent for, uh, or long saying in, in the sense that during this pandemic, being a proponent that this is long overdue here in BC. And I think there are a lot of interesting discussions of not just bringing in a paid sick leave program, but also how this is designed. So thank you so much for your wisdom, your ideas and your passions, of course. Uh, this was really informative. I'm now going to turn over things to Laird Cronk. Laird is the president of the BC Federation of Labor. Throughout the pandemic, Laird and the BC Fed have been advocating for support for working people and their families. Paid sick leave has just been at the top of this list and which, which is why this uh, conversation is so important. So over to you, Laird. Thanks, Mo, and, and really thanks everybody out there who's been uh, watching in Cyberland. This is such an important conversation. I want to thank Minister Baines for opening remarks. I want to thank our three amazing panelists. If we could capture Kim Novak's energy, the renewable energy crisis would be resolved. Uh, this is not your old labor movement. This is fantastic new work. Uh, thank Minister Wood for the tremendous work they do in their country and taking the time to share with us. Uh, and thank Dr. Premji for the insightful uh, comments today and the expertise that you bring. Look, this is really important that we have these conversations. This is a historic moment in time for British Columbia where we have legislation that says we're going to have paid sick leave January 1st. And right now is that moment where it's being decided the details. Please go to bcfed.ca and you'll see our report on paid sick leave. We make all of the arguments and all of the discussion points you've heard of today. And it's so important we need your help. This is a team effort. We are on the cusp of doing something good for business, good for workers in British Columbia. We've been working on this for so long together. We need a little bit more from all of you. I sound like I'm going to drive you to a televangelist type of thing, but what I'm really saying is this. We are right there. We are actually making a difference. We are getting there. The government released their options paper today. The options paper talked about three days or five days or 10 days, and it's kind of a survey. So important that you and everybody else you know that's interested in this goes to that site, and it is, it's a bit long, but I'm going to read it, engage.ca forward slash paid sick leave. I'll say it one more time, engage.gov.bc.ca forward slash paid sick leave. Tell them 10 days paid sick leave by employers makes sense in British Columbia. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you, Mo, for taking care of us today and guiding us through this. Uh, everybody stay safe and thanks for coming. Laird, thank you so much for those comments. The website that was mentioned there is in the chat if you want to take a quick note uh, of that. Um, of course, please, again, thank you to the panelists, the organizers, and of course, thank you to you, the attendees, for joining us today. I really do hope that this will engage all of us in terms of the next steps of the government's consultation on, on their paid sick uh, leave program. Uh, as we hear today, there's obviously a lot on the line for BC workers. This is really important, uh, not just for indiv individual workers, but their families and our communities as a whole. So thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for being engaged. Have a great day. <laughs>